Hi, everybody. We're going to get ready to get started um, so we can kind of leave some room for question and answer at the end. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shonda Hurd. I'm with the ERE program here at SICE. And the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy is um, proud and glad to present uh, Professor Jessica Fanzo today. She's our uh, honored speaker. i uh, give you a, few, a little bit of a background on her before we bring her up to begin her talk today. Uh, let's see. She is the joint appointed Bloomberg Distinguished Associate Professor of Ethics in Global Food and Agriculture here at Johns Hopkins SICE, the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She also serves as the Director of the Global Food Ethics and Policy Program. Prior to coming to Johns Hopkins, Jessica was an Assistant Professor of Nutrition in the Institute of Human Nutrition and Department of Pediatrics at Columbia University in New York. She also served as the Senior Advisor of Nutrition Policy at the Center of Globalization and Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute. Um, she has worked in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and East Africa for more than a decade. Her area of expertise focuses on the multi-sectoral and system approaches to ensure better nutrition and diets. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming uh, Jessica Fanzo. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Shonda, and, and thanks to the ERE group for inviting me. Um, it's good to see some of my students from last semester in the room. You guys already know all this, so you can get your lunch and go. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it's great to be here. And Shonda, thanks for, for organizing this and the, and the fantastic vegetarian lunch, which is very fitting for this talk. Um, so I'll get into it, and then I think Johannes, the head of ERE, is going to join us in a, after I uh, give, give the presentation. So today I'm going to talk about the food system. There's a lot of focus now globally on the food system, starting from the Sustainable Development Goals. There was an increased emphasis of why food systems are important for sustainable development. But over the last year or two, there's been so many reports on food systems, food systems being broken, food systems being failed, food systems being off the rails. And a lot of that has been spurred from the climate change agenda and the increased focus and attention on climate and the role of, of food systems within the climate agenda. Um, so just as a starting point, I'm gonna talk about the Anthropocene, what that means, um, and 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 why uh, it's so imperative for us to be to be working on climate. And then I'll really talk about food systems as being both victims and instigators of the continuing climate change that we see, and the role of diets within that. Um, the diets that we consume every day have their environmental footprints. Um, but they also can be a, a, a place for change in, in making an impact on climate change. And then I'll, we'll talk a bit about some big ethical questions that need to be considered when we're thinking about taking action in the food systems. And then I'll just end with a couple of, of big actions that I think the globe, the world, needs to take on. So first, the Anthropocene, which is actually a contentious uh, <laughs> a contentious name, a contentious definition. Um, it's been very debated of whether or not we are living in the era of the Anthropocene. But it's, it's generally defined as the Earth's most recent geological time period that's been human influenced. Um, we know that atmospheric, geological, hydrological, bios, uh, biospheric, and other Earth system processes are now being significantly altered by humans. Most governments in the world believe that, with the exception of a few, um, one being the place where we sit now, um, in that America, if there's a, a refusal that climate change is human-induced, then you really don't need to change human behavior. So it's a, a very political agenda to be considering uh, climate change is human induced, but the science is overwhelming that we are in the midst of this Anthropocene. And there's been many reports coming out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
uh, the IPCC report in 2018 looked at a world that would be 1.5, which is pretty much guaranteed where we're going to go to in the next 20 years. And there's been a few other IPCC reports, one on land change and food systems that came out in late 2019. And the new IPCC report is now under review. And if any of you work in climate change, I'm sure you've been asked to, to look at this early draft. And it's, I had a chance to look at it, and it's pretty scary. But the IPCC in 2018 really encapsulated the challenge of avoiding catastrophic climate breakdown requires rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And I found this quote true but terrifying at the same time. Um, a group of scientists uh, have been looking at the trajectories of climate change. And I know this is a bit hard to see. But all you really need to do is see the patterns. And what they, this group did was a group of scientists 25 years ago, back in 1992, they looked at what potentially climate change will do. Will the world get warmer? Will sea levels rise? Will there be significant deforestation and species loss? Well, this other group of scientists 25 years later looked at this publication called A Warning to Humanity and looked to see if what they predicted was true. And 25 years later, it turns out that it was true. And you see you know, massive vertebrae species lost, declines in forests, rising temperatures, rising CO2 emissions, rising dead zones. But what's interesting is that, and alarming, is the pace. And what Michael Mann calls the hockey stick approach. It's that whoosh in the last decade. The serious declines in species loss and deforestation and warming. And so it's a real call for action that we're seeing accelerated climate change and disruption. So what about food systems? What role do they play? Many in the world, as we think about climate change adaptation and mitigation, it's all about energy and transportation. Energy and transportation. It's what most of the convention of parties or the COP meetings are about. But we know that food systems are playing a big role in the whole climate agenda. Um, and just looking at global food systems, we've seen incredible progress in feeding the world, somewhat. But we've also seen some acceleration that's unsustainable, like emissions coming from agriculture has been rising, um, paired with global beef production demand rising, land area use for agriculture rising over the last 40 years, but flattening where about 40% of the, of the world's land is being used for agriculture. Staff of uh, foodborne illness-related infections rising. Now we've got the coronavirus, a foodborne illness. Um, air, air pollution rising, et cetera. So the food system is accelerating in both positive and negative ways. And things have improved. This first graph shows you famine victims. We don't have the massive famines that we had in, in the Bengali, India type famines. The last big famine was Ethiopia in the 1980s where millions and millions of people died. Um, we still see smaller crises, smaller famines, but not at the scale that we saw 100 plus years ago. Our world is producing lots of energy. The agriculture system is efficient at producing that energy, and there's obviously downsides to that. And we've seen undernutrition, particularly stunting, which is chronic undernutrition, come down slowly, but it's coming down over time. And that's a big achievement. So the world did have 40% uh, children who are stunted in 2000, and now we hover about 25, and I'll come back to that. So there's been progress. Food systems, um, while making progress, are contributing to greenhouse gases. Um, when we look at uh, the about 40% of the land mass used, a lot of it pastures and meadows or cultivated crops. When we look at the greenhouse gas emissions coming from production and land use changes, it hovers around 25% of all the greenhouse gases emitted are coming from food systems. And this is obviously coming from ruminant enteric 
fermentation, cows burping, the burping methane, a very toxic greenhouse gas. But it's also the energy to move those big creatures around, slaughter them, get them from China to the US to Argentina, what have you. Uh, fertilization of, of crops and rice methane, which people don't really talk about much, but rice production produces a significant amount of methane and just the energy to, to run the entire, entire sector. So it's about 25% of greenhouse gases. So what's going to happen with food systems and climate? Well, one big issue is that we're looking at the quantity of food. Are we going to be able to feed the 12 billion people? This is a big question. Models show that we're going to be constrained. We see that this is showing you in a business as usual, three degree scenario warmer world, which is pretty dire. Um, we see the percentage yield change in major crops. And you see red means declines in yield. So really in the global south, you see lots of declines in the major crops. Up in the north, so those of you who own land in Canada, you're going to have a lot of bumper crops as the world gets warmer. But overall, globally, we're seeing a downtrodden yield of major crops. We also see that there's going to be significant water stress. This is showing you by 2025. In a business as usual type scenario, we see water stress, the red being higher. And again, some of the southern tropic, the global south, the southern tropic areas, all along the, the border of Sahel into, into sub-Saharan Africa and South, south Asia having uh, particular strains, although already experiencing that. Species loss will continue, Get, again, business as usual, a better scenario of climate change into the future showing you all species uh, threat risk is going to be quite significant, particularly um, in sub-Saharan Africa. You can imagine the flora and diversity of fauna in, in some of these places are going to be threatened and, and, will, and already are. Um, and it's not only the, the environmental effects and the food yields, it's the quality of those foods. Sam Myers and others at Harvard have shown that um, the quality of nutrients will decline in a CO2 fertilization world where you have more CO2 in the atmosphere. Essential nutrients like zinc and iron and protein will decline in some of the major crops. And this is alarming. And they've, only looked at a suite of crops. We don't know the impacts across a range of crops grown in different agronomic conditions. And safety, which is probably the, the most under, uh, underrepresented area, but currently on the minds of many governments with coronavirus, will really be a, an issue. Foodborne related illnesses will change unpredictably, rapidly. Uh, this is showing you aflatoxin contamination uh, in maize, which is already a problem in much of sub-Saharan Africa, in peanuts, rice, and maize. And under different effects, two, two degree world, very possible in the trajectories we're going now, and five degree, which is catastrophic. But you see the, the red showing up as aflatoxin contamination of, of maize or corn. Um, so real big issues around food safety, foodborne illness, pathogenesis, and that predictability of that. And we also know, I'm going to totally depress all of you, but hopefully we'll end on an uplifting note. Um, um, the environmental impacts. This is a, a, a study we published in Nature before the Eat Lancet Commission, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, showing you different animal foods, or sorry, different food groups, so animal products, vegetable oils, fruits and veg, and showing you across a suite of environmental indicators. So the first bar is greenhouse gases in 2010, current state, 2050, business as usual, and then cropland use, so land change, uh, water use, nitrogen and phosphorus application, eutrophication. You see different impacts 
of the production systems and the ability to grow those foods on these environmental indicators. And you see this stress. So animal products have a particular impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So, and we can talk about that. That can be debated by some, but the science is pretty overwhelming that ruminants have a big environmental impact because of the methane production. But many solutions out there exist to, to mitigate against that. Um, but if you look at some of the other products, you see that fruits and veg, which you're all eating, you're eating a vegetarian meal today, have their own environmental footprints on freshwater use. A paper just came out on, on tree and ground nuts showing that they require lots of water. Think of the almonds in California, the avocados. Think of these kind of classic crops of water constraints. Um, have, have big environmental footprints. And so it's not just that beef is bad. It depends on how food is grown, where it's grown, who's growing it, where it moves. All of that matters when we look at the impacts on the environment. And so we have to look at the life cycle assessment, the cradle to grave type approach when we look at foods. And many of you will be surprised when you see staples as having quite a big impact across the suite of environmental indicators. But it's important to note that between 40 to 70% of the staples, depending on where it is, are used to feed the animals that we grow and raise for ourselves. So the contribution of the entire animal food system is pretty significant. So, so, where, so where are we? So diets in the Anthropocene are one of the biggest uh, pieces within the food system. We think about food growing, stored, processing, packaging, moving to markets. But then you, as a consumer, a citizen, you walk into a market, you walk into a restaurant, you walk into the ERE seminar, and you have to decide what you're going to eat, right? Our diets matter. They matter significantly, not only for our health, but for the environment. But the science is riddled with controversy at the moment. I'm sure a lot of you are seeing articles of mixed messages around this. So, so let's talk about it. So we published a paper uh, last year showing that diets are now the top risk factor of morbidity, mortality, and disability in the world, diets. And this is the Global Burden of Disease Project, a big project that Chris Murray at University of Washington started. He's gotten lots of money from the Gates Foundation to look at disease burden around the world and what is causing that disease burden. And over time, the risks have shifted. We've seen shifts from um, smoking being the number one risk factor to now diets. These diets beat out air pollution, everything. Which is incredible because diets are meant to nurture us, not kill us. And the types of diets, and I know it's hard for you guys to see, this is all very blurry even to me. I'm either old or the slides are a little bit blurry. But anyway, um, <clears throat> the types of diets uh, that are, are really the biggest risk are diets high in sodium, high in sugars and salt, salt sugar, high in added sugars, high in unhealthy fats like trans fats, low in fruits, low in vegetables, low in legumes, low in nuts and seeds, right? It's that typical diet, there's not a lot of controversy around the healthy diet, um, that is causing the greatest risk. And it's the lack of eating health-promoting foods that is the biggest risk factor. Um, so what, what this, this study doesn't account for, though, is the surge in processed packaged foods, which is everywhere in the United States. These foods tend to be what's called ultra-processed or highly processed or junk food that are high in salt, sugar, and fat. They're really tasty, they're really convenient, they're pretty cheap, so you can see where this is going. And this dietary pattern is moving all over the world. And so what we're left with, because of those, di those types of diets and the dietary patterns we're seeing is this massive malnutrition burden in the world. 
So while some global health statistics have been improving, child mortality, way down. HIV AIDS infectivity, plateauing. You know, we're seeing some sure signs of global health working. Why, when we know so much about nutrition, do we see such little progress on the nutrition front? And I'll talk a bit about that. But one in three people is malnourished on the planet. We have still 821 million people who are hungry. That number's gone up for the third year in a row. We see 150 million children who are stunted, short like me, but seriously, very debilitated for the rest of their lives, cognitively impaired. And you could say, well, that doesn't seem like very much, but that's 23% of all the children under the age of five. In some countries, countries of conflict like Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, post-conflict countries like Burundi, Rwanda, they have huge burdens of stunting. I work in Timor-Leste. The stunting rate of children is 55%. It's very hard for a country to get out of that trap. The development of those countries is very slow. We have 50 million children who are wasted or acutely malnourished, seasonal hungers, complex crisis. They're very at risk for dying. We have 2.1 billion people who are overweight and obese. And there's projections that this year that number's going up to 2.6. That's insane. That's an insane amount of people. And once you are overweight and obese, it is very hard to get out of that status for many reasons um, that are beyond this talk. Um, and 88% of countries face overlapping burdens double, triple, quadruple burdens of underweight, overweight, and micronutrient deficiencies. So it's incredibly debilitating with diets as the major contributor to this. The other issue we see is that the type of diet, a dietary pattern that you consume, has a big impact on your health and on the planet. So this is showing you different types of data uh, 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 coming from uh, risk data, coming from diets, different types of diets, comparing the Mediterranean diet, the pescatarian or fish diet, and a vegetarian diet, to what's considered an omnivorous diet, the typical US Western type diet. And it's looking at the risk, the, the risk reduction of diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality, and all cause, any type of mortality. And you see that these different diets have a protective effect as compared to the Western diet. At the same time, these type of diets also have impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. The very kind of omnivorous diet, which incorporates a lot of livestock, pig, beef, has bigger impacts on greenhouse gases. Whereas a vegetarian diet has a much lower impact. So there's a win-win there around vegetarian diets, having low environmental footprint, uh, healthy for you as, a, as an individual. And obviously there's nuances in that depending on where you live and the kind of access to healthy foods you get. In many low-income settings like in, in rural Africa, these animal source foods can become a very important part of the diet because you have small stomachs. Children have very small stomachs. They can't eat a lot of food. So you want a powerful package of nutrients. And sometimes animal source foods can be that powerful package uh, for children who are growing and developing. So there's a lot of confusion in this space of, of between those people who work in low income countries and are dealing with very undernourished populations and people who are dealing with the American population, are those diets, should they be the same? And the, the answer really is no, they should not be the same. And we, we need to expect different types of, of diets based on the demands of the local context. Now the Eat Lancet Commission was a really, um, I see people laughing, <laughs> you know the Eat Lancet. The Eat Lancet was a really controversial report. Would you agree with me? very controversial report that came out. I was on it, I'll admit, under my breath. Um, but it, was, it brought together 32 scientists across a range of, of disciplines and countries um, to come up with what would the diet look like if we were to achieve optimal human health and stay within, quote, the planetary boundaries. 
What would that diet look like? And uh, this was a very controversial commission, and uh, we can talk about that. I'm happy to talk to anyone about kind of the political issues, the fallout from it, but also being on it, you know, getting lots of hate mail, and it was wonderful. Um, but it, it, uh, it's an interesting endeavor to do. And all to the young students, if you're inv ever invited to be on some kind of a commission, don't ever do it. Um, that's why you'll get like gray hair like me. But what they did was that they looked at the different food groups and said, OK, well, what do we do? Like, how would, how would we achieve human health and stay within planetary boundaries? And they developed what's called the healthy reference diet, which is this orange. And they looked at different food groups to see, well, where is the world at? Are they? achieving human health and staying within boundaries. And this is the global picture. And this is just showing you that globally, we eat a lot of beef and we eat a lot of starchy staples. Very kind of Midwestern American type diet is proliferating around the world. And this is showing you North America. So North Americans, United States, Canada, we eat a lot of beef, a lot of potatoes and starchy staples, a lot of dairy, a lot of chicken, and um, what is that? No, eggs and dairy. And if you look in the middle, we don't consume enough of the good stuff. We're not even meeting the health boundary for fruits, veg, legumes, nuts, and seeds. So we're eating a lot of meats and starchy staples and not a lot of the veggies. Here's Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of starchy staples, maize, cassava, rice. And again, meeting the requirement on meat, but not a lot of the good stuff. And here's South Asia, really completely within the boundaries, planetary boundaries and the health boundaries, but really not um, any eating enough of the good stuff. So what does this say? There's massive inequity. You know, some people are eating way more meat than they need to. And I think a lot of you know this. You go, if you spend a day anywhere in the United States, you go, I was just at a hotel the other day and on the buffet in the morning, there was like six kinds of meat for breakfast. You don't need to eat meat at breakfast probably. You could probably get by without eating meat, bacon and sausage. But you see this massive inequity between Africa and, and, and the Americas. And when we look at the Eat Lancet, what would it take to eat that healthy diet. If all the world were to take on the Eat Lancet diet, what would the agriculture system need to do? So this is showing you in yellow, 2050 business as usual with us wasting the food that we currently do, which is 30% of all food produced is wasted approximately. There's debate about that number at the moment, but it's a lot. So the yellow shows that. The green is showing you the Eat Lancet diet and cutting food waste in half by 2050. Possible. So this is what would need to change. No increase in grains. Now most of the agri world's agriculture system, all the R&D in agriculture, goes towards focusing on rice, maize, wheat, and potatoes. Most of it. So that would need to completely shift, not only in the production systems, but the whole way we think about agriculture, which is a hard ask right now for, for many. Vegetables and fruits would need to increase 50%. Fish, legumes, nuts, 50, 75, and 150%. This fish would need to come from aquaculture because we would outstrip the wild marine resources 100 times over but aquaculture at the moment is not sustainable. So we need to figure that out. Uh, the legumes and nuts, we don't have the varieties on hand now to even produce the yields needed if the world were to increase on that side. And then red meat production would have to come down 65%. When this report came out, the livestock industry did not really like that. That red, that little red arrow, um, that gets into issues of livelihoods, um, that gets into issues of culture. We're doing a project of looking at beef. Why is beef valued in the United States? We talked to ranchers. It's a part of their identity. 
you're, you're, you're threatening people's identity. So this is a really controversial view of how food production should look like um, in the world. So what do we do? And I'm just going to throw out a few things, and then, and then I'll get into just the five things I think we need to, to take away. We're really, we're really in a situation of, of evidence building, political will and political commitment, but all of that is tethered to these deep ethical issues. And there's a lot of disagreement about how to move forward. How are we going to feed the world well and keep within the planetary boundaries? It is a massive question. The question used to be, a decade ago, how are we going to feed 12 billion people? That was sort of the question. But now the health and environment agenda has been added to that. How are we going to feed people well and keep all the incredible species on the planet? Can we do it? Are there going to be trade-offs? Are we willing to live with those trade-offs? And what do policymakers care about, right? These are like big issues, all under the context of every country wanting economic growth. And what are the trade-offs with that? So one thing is that I think we know that the decisions of some countries impact many poor people in the world. So a question is, do you have the right to eat wrongly? Do you have the right to smoke in front of anybody? Some people, some people attribute diet to tobacco. Do you have the right to just make, eat whatever you want? Who cares? I hope I've convinced you that diets and our, the way we are producing our food does actually matter. But it's not going to necessarily affect you so immediately, although I think it will more than we think it is. But it's really impacting the economically poor right now. Farmers, consumers, sitting in rural Africa, sitting in South Asia, who are still stuck in poverty traps. So our decisions matter for them. But for some politicians, they don't care about this. You know, they don't care if it affects people in Africa. Right? And, and I won't mention names. But um, I mean, this is showing you a map of the United States of who's going to be most impacted with flooding over the next decade. And you see it concentrated in the South, particularly the Southeast, poorest parts of the country. Some of you know Katrina really well, was really eye opening. For, for my generation, like 9-11 was, and for, for all you youngsters, Katrina was a bit of a shock to see the poverty of the United States and the inability for people to leave a situation that was building very quickly. And that whole view sort of woke people up to this idea of, of, of who suffers from some of these decisions. We also have profound inequities in food distribution and who gets access to healthy food. So I'm sorry this is very small, but I, I've put the, the, hopefully we can share these slides with everyone who, who wants them. This is showing you just prices of animal source foods. Very expensive in many parts of the world, but very high demand. And this work by Derek Hetty and Harold Alderman basically show that eggs, dairy, milk, red meat, very unattainable in low-income contexts, very unattainable in many rural places because it's just too expensive. And this is a little bit outside the United States. Hamburger meat is not the true cost of what it should be. It's quite cheap here. But in many parts of the world, these perishable animal source foods, they're not available at markets. They're very expensive. So when we're talking about the Eat Lancet diet, I think some African governments are like, we're not even registering on this because we don't even get these foods. Half our population doesn't even have access to goat meat once a month. So what are we talking about here? This is a, maybe a high-income country uh, issue that we need to deal with. So how do we deal with the notion of what you're hearing a lot now on the climate agenda, Africa saying, it's our turn now. Yeah, United States you made a lot of mistakes. You've put us in this situation. But now it's our turn to eat meat. So what do we do in that context? And how do we ensure that there's equity across the food system? 
The other implications, and this is interesting because as I was looking at this about an hour ago to put this slide up, I decided to put it up because I think you know that cows produce, a, they need a lot of energy, they need a lot of water, and they need a lot of feed, and they need a lot of land, right? It's just uncomparable compared to the chicken, for example. But we know chicken and pork are rising across the world. Chicken is replacing beef in many places, including the US. Beef is actually on the decline in the United States. But you know, this, this footprint diagram was started a long time ago in the 1970s. Diet for a small planet. What is it? Diet for a small planet. Le Pay. She put. She talked about this in the 1970s. This argument's been going on. That was 50 years ago, almost. Her book was published, and we're still talking about this and debating it. It's incredible to me. Um, and then we have the whole ethical issue around these other foods, you know, insects. Is that going to be? permissible and acceptable to societies. It is in some, you know. In some places, insects are really popular. Uh, the alt meat space, alt proteins growing here, but a lot of questions about its health and environmental footprints. And the lab-grown meats, finless, you know, finless foods, all of these lab-grown meats have a lot of ethical implications to them, like the GMO debate has had, where GMOs have become intractable. It's at the UN level where you see governments debate GM foods. And it's possible that the lab-grown meats will fall under the same kind of Frankenstein food uncertainties about health and environment that the GMOs have, although a lot of these startup companies aren't even thinking about the ethical implications. So what can we do? Well. There's been, like I said at the very beginning, many, many food system reports that have been coming out, and they all call for a grand transformation of the food system. They recommend lots of different things, right? And, and, and many of them are general. They're right, so you know, we need a grand transformation, but there's not a lot on how to do that. And so there needs to be more nuance in how this is gonna happen. Um, this is one example of a report, the FOLU report, that really showed these different pillars of changing diets, changing ag production systems, um, changing, changing uh, energy and, and, and tax policies. And this is a, a class in itself to talk about some of the actions needed that, that, that deal with human and planetary health. Um, but what hasn't really been articulated is the economic piece of that. What is all this going to cost? What's this transformation going to cost the world? And how much are we going to shift? And who's responsible for that? And I'll just highlight five things. There's, there's been talk about this syndemic of we're seeing now undernutrition, overweight, and obesity, and climate change. And they're calling it a syndemic. They're very related. They're interconnected. And they often involve the same platforms. And there's a lot of discussion about how do you do double duty, triple duty, where you do one thing that tackles all three. So how can you consolidate and create policy coherence around this syndemic? And there's a great report by the, another Lancet Commission by Boyd Swinburne, uh, Bill Dietz, who's at George Washington, and others showing um, what you can do to tackle this triple syndemic. The other thing is that we need governments to start caring about this issue. There is not one country that has a food systems policy. There's climate strategies, there's nutrition policies, there are dietary guidelines, there's agriculture policies. In the US, we have the Farm Bill. But there's not one country that has created a holistic food system thinking about climate, health, environment, agriculture, women's empowerment that brings it all together. Not one. Brazil came close, but nowhere near the mark. We need to start thinking about agriculture in the context of environment. And a lot of, business, of the business sector and a lot of producers are already on this page, right? It's, I feel it's a lack on some of the big agriculture research uh, centers. I don't think World Bank is there yet. 
where we really uh, need to think about the impacts. And it's not just diet, although diet, shown here in green, the flexitarian diet, a more plant-based diet, has a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions. We know when we do the models, this was uh, from the Nature paper, that cutting food loss and waste in half will have a big impact across water, land use, eutrophication. Better technologies on farm, better management of land, ecosystem services, water management will be important as well, not just diets. We need to think about the people who are producing our food and what the trade-offs and constraints that they have. Um, I love this quote by Ruth DeFries from, she wrote a book called The Big Ratchet. She's at Columbia University, some of you may know her. She said, now we are transforming from farmers to urbanites. Our newest experiment to feed massive numbers of people from the work of just a few is beginning. The outcome is yet to be seen. The average age of the world's farmer is 62. Who is going to feed us? We keep talking about this agriculture food system transformation, but who's going to be there to transform it? That's a big question and is yet to be answered. People talk about urban agriculture and the promise of urban agriculture. It's not going to feed 12 billion people right now. Rooftop gardens growing microgreens is not going to cut it on the top of Whole Foods, right? In Red Hook, Brooklyn. So we need, we need something bigger and better to support all of those who are the raisers of animals, the food producers, the fisher folk, everybody. And this is a big, big constraint. If you talk to a young African who's in rural Kenya, it is very hard to convince her to not go to Nairobi in Kenya and get further schooling and come back and work on her shamba, on her parents' shamba. That is a hard ask. It's pretty drudgerous. So we need to be thinking about what it means to, to produce food and, and who's producing it. And we need to help consumers navigate this really complex space. This is a really contentious area. People are confused. One day you hear red meat's good for you. The next day it's bad for you. And a lot of the nutrition science, if you read the headlines carefully and, and the articles carefully, you'll see that you really need to closely look at who's funding what. Um, there was just a paper coming out that the animal source food recommendations of the Eat Lancet will not help to mitigate against non-communicable diseases, diabetes, heart disease, etc. And if you look closely, it was funded by the Norwegian Cattlemen's Association and the Egg Council. So. I'm not saying that data is wrong, but you got a question, is there an unconscious bias going on there when they got that funding and produced those results? Because 95% of the evidence shows that red meat is actually not great for cardiovascular disease and diabetes and, and colorectal cancer. So it's, you have to question some of these things really carefully. And this has created a huge amount of confusion with consumers. And a lot of the rhetoric doesn't fit with consumers' lifestyles. What do people care about the most when they're picking a food when they walk into a market? Taste, price, and convenience. And many of the things that we talk about in health and environment do not fit in those three categories. So we need to be thinking about the consumer and where they, they sit in all of this. And we need this enabling environment. We need governments to care. We need industry to play their role. They do some good, but they do a lot of bad in the food system now. You know, they do generally some good corporate responsibility, but we need industry to step up more. And how can they have business goals that are aligned with public health goals? It's a big issue for them. Um, and we need CSOs, civil society, youth groups to, to really push governments, push them hard. Like, uh, to, to really care about the climate and food agenda. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with five questions. So can we have both human and planetary health? Can we have it? Can we have it both? Have all the species roaming around the world, lots of flora and fauna, the orangutans in Sumatra, and have optimal human health? 
And if not, what's going to win out? How can we create more equity and justice across the food system? You saw lots of inequities. And who is responsible for making that happen? Trump? Is he going to create the social justice we need across the food system? Maybe in his, maybe in his next campaign election he will. Um, who owns the food system? Do governments own it? If they don't even have a food systems policy, they don't own it. And if you don't own something, how can you hold anyone accountable for doing good or making changes? It's just a free-for-all. It's a goat rodeo. Anyone can play and do whatever they want, right? And that's a lot of how the food system has been run. How can we better align policies to, to do this kind of double duty action where we think about human health and planet? There's so many solutions out there to do both. And then when we think about a lot of the climate stuff I showed you is modeling, right? And behind modeling and scenarios, there's lots of assumptions being made. How do we model the unknowns, right? So I was talking to uh, the guys at, at IFPRI that do the impact modeling. And when they were doing the climate modeling two decades ago, they said, well, we never envisioned that everyone would be walking around with a handheld computer in their hand and staring at it all day. Like, we never modeled that technology, which has profound implications on the way we live, climate, everything, the way we eat. Um, Trump becoming elected in the United States has huge implications for the global cooperative climate change agreements of not ratifying the COP, right? That had a huge implication. No one modeled that Trump effect. How do you model these kind of shocks to the system? This is, this is a real conundrum for climate scientists to figure out modeling these un the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld said. Um, so so these, are, these are some of the big issues that I think the, the modeling world will have to to deal with. And I'll end there. Thanks. Hey, Johannes. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Jess, for the talk. I think it's the first time I've seen an overflow room here in Rome Auditorium during my time. So you're clearly the rock star uh, nah. of our speaker <laughs> series. That's fantastic. I think I'm mostly going to rely on the audience to ask yeah. questions. I think that's a lot more interesting than my obscure academic musings. But I do have a few questions for you. So the first one is I'm interested in this double duty, triple duty yeah. stuff. Suppose that we don't do that, we do like single duty. Yeah. Is it that bad? So suppose that we have a carbon tax or yeah. we do something about methane. Are there some real like risks and downsides? Do you think that could be bad, or should we go for those opportunities when they? they no, come? yeah, I think we need both, right? You need you need these kind of very single interventions. You know, we think carbon tax, soda tax. We need these very specific interventions. But I think it's quite interesting for donors to think about well, how can I get more bang for my buck? If I invest in this, I'll have impacts on stunting, I'll have impacts on obesity, and maybe at the same time change the planet. I think that's enticing to people if there's strong evidence for that. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have a lot of those double and triple duty type right. actions. But so I think we need both. But I think for a lot of donors, they're looking for kind of the, not the silver bullets, but the the machine gun approach, right? <laughs> or I don't know what it, how you describe it. You know, something that if they invest in it, they'll see immediate impacts and potentially long term. You know, and everyone talks about like breastfeeding as one of those early, early intervention, early childhood, very important in mitigating against undernutrition, but may have lifelong effects in in preventing obesity into adulthood. And there's a lot of evidence for that. So there's a big push to for women to exclusively breastfeed. It's kind of this double duty action. The climate change piece of that is less clear, but yeah. But I think you need all of it, yeah. But no, politicians don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear like, you need 50 things in the toolbox and maybe 10 of them are gonna work. It's like, maybe that's not good enough anymore. So, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, 
I think that's actually a nice bridge to my second question, which is you mentioned that none of these countries has a food systems mm -hmm. policy in place. What about, are there any good local or subnational yeah. examples? Can you just tell us, give us one example of something that seems like pretty good and uh, yeah. that we should replicate? Yeah, a lot of cities have incredible food policies. Uh, New York City has got Michael Bloomberg established a great food systems policy. Um, and he's up in the polls right now, interestingly. But anyway, um, yeah, but he had a great food policy for New York City that really looked at the kind of equity issues of you know, accessibility of diets, greening New York City. It all fell within, within his mandate. Um, and it was a, a strong policy that's still being instituted now. And there's a lot of other cities that are doing this. Um, you know, Melbourne, uh, Amsterdam, so, so there's a lot of action happening, and I think you know this in the climate change situation of, of cities taking action. They're not waiting for states or countries to take action. They're just doing it themselves. So you're seeing a lot of movement on that front. Yeah. Okay, so that was not a paid advertisement. Uh, Professor Fanzo is the Bloomberg District <laughs> Professor. We don't take political contributions here at SAIS, no. nonetheless. Right? Uh, so, um, Let's hope nothing bad happens during this whole campaign thing, because his name is in front of my professorship. But anyway. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, well, I'm the Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz Professor, so I see a lot of bad uh, stuff happening in my area as well. <laughs> Um, those were really my questions. We have a lot of people in the room. Uh, I think we have another 20 minutes, 25 minutes to go. So why don't we open it up? I can see already lots of, uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Michael Wiener. I'm a uh, Latin American studies MA student here. And uh, my question is actually framed pretty similarly to the last question you asked about if there are any singular examples of good public policies surrounding global food, but it's about the private sector. So you mentioned yeah. that the private sector needs to do more yeah. um, in this space, but are there any examples, whether that be in agribusiness or food producing companies like Kraft or others, that where they have taken positive steps? Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And I would say, so one example that's often used and it's becoming more important in the public health world that industry is doing voluntarily is reformulation. So they're reformulating foods to try to get down the sugar or salt content as much as possible. A great public health example is removing trans fat or you know, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. And the reason why that happened, they're really trying to eliminate it completely from the food system across the world. The United States is banning it. And the reason why that happened is because the evidence was so crystal clear that it had detrimental impacts on human health and very, very solid randomized controlled trial evidence that adding trans fat to food was, was detrimental. And it was easy to take it out and substitute it with something else. A lot of the substitution ended up being palm oil, which is not great for human health, better than trans fat, but has a lot of detrimental impacts on environment and deforestation. But um, so that's a great example of where industry has been trying very hard to get the sugar and salt content down as much as possible while still making the food palatable, making it still be able to be on shelves for longer periods of time. Um, we were working on a paper looking at the impact of reformulation on public health. And it's interesting talking to industry because it is difficult to do it from a food technology point of view. Uh, uh, one of the industry interviewees said that they were trying, I was telling my, my class this last year, that they were trying to get the salt content down on hot dogs. And it made the hot dogs liquid in the middle <laughs> when they thought they had the right salt point, right? I said, this is incredibly challenging for them to do this. But, you know, some of the best, I'm going to say, quote, partnerships, although I don't think industry considered as a, considers it a partnership is the regulatory space. When government regulates, industry often will follow because they have to. And a big, uh, so you see Mexico's soda tax is a regulation type thing. Industry doesn't really have to do anything. It falls on the consumer. Um, but it does make industry a bit nervous. And so Pepsi is trying to cut the sugar content across all their products by 40%. 
So you know, their products could potentially not even be taxed. Another example is Chile. They did something called the front of the pack label where they put black stop signs on food that had high salt, sugar, and fat. So it's a warning label. And it went one step further in that obviously you see it as a consumer. This is a warning sign. This is not a healthy food. But they took it a step further and they regulated it. So if that food had a stop sign on it, you weren't allowed to sell it in a school. You weren't allowed to advertise it on TV during child watching hours. So they regulated that food. And a study just came out looking at the impact of that warning label. And sales of those foods, those packaged processed foods with the stop sign, sales went down 23% in two years in Chile. So everyone in the world is looking at that right now of how do we do that. So it's a regulation by government. And what happened with industry, they knew that the regulation was going to happen. So they all started reformulating to try to not get the warning sign on their products. So it spurred action. I think industry, though, has been really good on the environment side. Why? Because they're really worried about their supply chains. They're really concerned about it. So this whole sustainability issue is very front and center for a lot of, a lot of the food and beverage companies. Um, the nutrition one, there's much less sort of successes in this space. Um, but that, that'll come in time. Fortification is another big one, industry fortification. You fortify a food vehicle, like a staple flour and oil, with a nutrient. And you see that everywhere, and that's been quite successful iodized salt. Um, your milk is fortified. So they're trying to do that and s spread that out into the low and middle income countries as well. So that's a really good example of often public private partnerships where government and industry have worked really well together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Hi, Cypress Links from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, thank you, Jess. That was fantastic as always. Um, my question has to do with um, a lot of the times when we're talking about food systems change, and maybe it's just my own personal bias, but it feels like a lot of the blame gets put on the consumer end. Mm. Food waste. Oh, yeah. well, if you just stop throwing away so much food at home yeah. or, um, you know, stop buying sugary beverages. What can be done, and I know this is a multi-sector, yeah. multi-system issue, can be done to move it up the food system yeah. when we go maybe yeah. even to production, all the way back to production. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting you ask that question because I'm in the middle of working on something called the United Nations Voluntary Guidelines on Food Systems. And this is being negotiated right now in the UN by all member states, all countries. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Developing consensus on something like this is a nightmare. But uh, governments recognize that the food system is out of control, right? And, and consumers have very little, um, very little weight in, in, in this. But I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about where sometimes that's not true. But the place where consumers engage with the food system is what's called the food environment. This is where you walk in to a market and make a decision. And you bring with you all your baggage, right? Your religion, your culture, your what you want to pay, you know, how many you have in your family, your knowledge, what you, what, you, what you like. But that food environment is very much influencing your decisions. You know, where is it in the store? Is it advertised? Is it your favorite brand? Does it have some, like, little chicken with a red barn in front of it? Like, looking like it's, ooh, it's natural, it's organic, I'm going to get that, which I am always susceptible to. Especially with like makeup products. Are you ladies obsessed with like the brown colored leaves on the front of, anyway, whatever. Um, all of this stuff is playing into your decision making, right? Around um, what you're gonna buy, the, the price point. Buy one, get one free. Um, and this is, you know, how far are you from the market? What kind of market is it? So all of this is influencing consumers. Um, and, and we really need to change the choice architecture around these foods, incentivize retailers. Um, and there's lots of examples of how to do that. It's just nothing's been scaled. On the agriculture side, we need a complete reshift in the way we think about agriculture, the way research is done, the way it's funded. There's, a, there's the CGIAR, the big 
agriculture research conglomerate. IFPRI, some of you go to IFPRI, ERI, CIMIT, all of these big agriculture institutes, they're undergoing a, re a reform process right now called the One CGIAR. But there's a whole series of papers in the Food Policy Journal led by Chris Barrett, great ag economist, asking Lawrence Haddad, World Food Prize winner, Pedro Sanchez, World, Fi World uh, Food Prize winner, what they would do about the CG. And many of the papers say, we need to start producing more nutritious foods instead of 75% of all that's grown on 10 crops, which are the seeds and the staples, you know, the staple crops and the oil crops. So, so I think we need kind of these two shifts. But demand can be very influencing on supply. Think of the gluten, uninformed movement of gluten being really bad for you. And everyone has a gluten allergy, although not many probably do. It's more about kind of a weight loss tactic. Um, and how that's completely reshaped the food supply from the wheat varieties being grown to try to decrease the gluten in those wheat varieties. So talk about a demand completely having the supply side scramble to address. Um, so sometimes demand and catching on can be quite powerful. So, but, but it, it is, you often see parent blame, parents being blamed for their children. It's just that, that way of thinking is very outdated in the scientific Good literature. Action. Yeah. Hi, Megan Boynton. I'm the agriculture policy reporter with Bloomberg Government, which makes this funny. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I'm curious, are there any bills going through Congress right now that you support personally that you think would further uh, food policy? I know that this isn't necessarily a bill, but on a federal level, the USDA just released its science blueprint, which actually includes climate adaptation yeah. for the first time. Yeah, it's awesome. So what do you think on a federal level should be done? Or is I, being done? I'll, I'll, you know, I think a lot... A lot. It's a bigger question. I think, um, I mean, it's, it's not going to happen, but I, I would love to see the U.S. dietary guidelines incorporate sustainability in their guidelines. I think it's been asked for many times. We came close in 2015. Now the 2020 are going to come out with no sustainability um, incorporated in them. So we've lost another five years in the cycle. And I feel that is a shame. Because our guidelines are often used, and this is of someone who worked at FAO that helps um, helps uh, disseminate the guidelines and how to create national dietary guidelines. The U.S. guidelines are often used as the exemplar for other countries, and to not have climate in in and sustainability issues in your guidelines, what a shame! You know, it's a shame. So. That, that would be my one thing, yeah. So one more on this side, and then we'll switch to the okay. other side of the aisle. Thank you. I'm Johanna Mendelson Foreman at the Stimson Center in American U. I wanted to get back to your initial comment that the linking of climate change and food systems mm. is still very segregated. And yeah. I think that discussion yeah. is only starting yeah. and not enough. So yeah. what would be your transformative recommendation because I think it's very hard to get people to think in the context of climate change being other than energy systems mm. or other types of changes but not related to diet. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, yeah, I'm just so enmeshed in that world. It's hard for me to, to not think of climate and food. Um, I mean, I think the, the COP is a great place to start. The COP, there's been more and more agriculture being mentioned in the last couple of COPs, which is incredible that it took this long, but I think that's an important um, issue. The United Nations, the Secretary General, has announced there's going to be a food summit in 2021. I think that is an important moment globally for people to really get on the same, same page. And a lot of those that are in the working groups that are working towards the summit come from climate, come from econ. It's not the usual suspects of just the nutrition group that worked on the Lancet you know, under nutrition series. It's, it's a whole group of different uh, actors coming together. And what is being uh, 
anticipated coming out of that is an IPCC for food and climate, its own body, an intergovernmental panel on climate and food. So like the land use one that came out that uh, Tim Benton led, there'll be a similar IPCC every five years on the latest evidence on food, diets, and climate. And that will be an important moment because what it does is it synthesizes the evidence and gets gets rid of the confusion and puts to every recommendation high confidence, medium confidence, low confidence, which policymakers want. Yeah, so. Um, hi, I'm Shelby Doran from American University. Um, I was just wondering, because you briefly mentioned the issue with manure coming from livestock and um, in that industry. Um, how do you incentivize the corporations to take on sustainable waste um, removal? Because there are methods to do it, yeah. but it's it's too cost it's too costly for them. So how do you incentivize them to do that to um, maybe lower the cost or something like that? And then also just to add on to that question, um, if we were to shift the way we eat, what would happen to those um, economies that rely on those food systems, such as um, agriculture and things like that? Yeah, those are really great questions. On the incentivizing, I don't really, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of technologies that are happening. And, and the Eat Lancet, they modeled a lot of different technologies um, that are available now, right? And I think it is getting the cost down, ensuring that, um, you know, they're affordable and accessible for, for, for those that are producing food. Um, you know, we could think about subsidies, a subsidy type system that moves away from just staple crops but focuses on other kind of subsidies, not only for other types of food but certain technologies, some kind of incentive that way. Um, and the second part of your question was on, um, so it, the Eat Lancet did talk a little bit about kind of the shift of uh, technologies and the shift of um, of sort of the dominance of agriculture moving to other countries, seeing more of a, a balance where we start to think about sub-Saharan Africa and Asia feeding the world. And obviously, that's kind of a, a sub-question that's been tackled for a long time. Many sitting in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are smallholder farmers. And they're still producing a significant amount of nutrients in the world. They're producing a lot of food within their own continents. Um, but there needs to be a shift in, in ensuring that they get the technology, the extension access that they need. And there's been a lot of focus on smallholders, but it's not at the level, you know, this is a UN type thing. EFAD, FAO, World Bank have focused on smallholder farmers, but it's it's getting a bit more serious about about that they are important players in the global food system. Um, there's a great paper by Mario Herrero and colleagues in Australia showing the prominence of smallholders and the types of food they produce and the amount of nutrients and types of crops they produce. They tend to have more diverse landscapes. So it really was a call for more investment in the smallholders. Um, and I don't think the Eat Lancet is saying that, um, you know, ranchers and farmers are going to need to go away and everything's going to be synthesized in a lab. It's a matter of just changing the practices of what, how food is currently produced to those that are more sustainable with now technologies, but future technologies, robotics, AI, everything. I'm sure some of you, I don't know if any of you read The Economist this week, the... Tom, Dick, and Harry robotics. I don't know if anyone read that. Anyway, but so there's going to be these kind of new technologies, and how do we make sure that those are affordable and accessible to 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 the to the global South? That's going to be the key. Yeah. Do you think co-ops would be an important role to think about for farming? Um, I mean, they exist now. They work well, especially women co-ops work really well where they pool resources. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and you see that a lot. Yeah. Hi, my name is Julia Rani. I work at the Center for Food Safety. Um, I oh, was so nice having this diversity of people. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> um, with regard to your emphasis on technology and how important that is for the future, I was also wondering 
internationally if there's also an emphasis on preserving and using you know traditional knowledge mm. um, and whether or not international yeah. organizations are making intentionally including that in the yeah. narrative God, such a great question um, it's really I have to tell you guys er, er, this is on video huh Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the, so the UN is deliberating on these voluntary guidelines on food systems for nutrition. And there's a lot of talk about technology, GMOs, future foods, all this stuff. But there's a lot of talk about indigenous people's knowledge, traditional cultures' knowledge, and that that is evidence, experiential evidence. It's knowledge. It should be protected. It should be preserved. Um, and it's really interesting when you sit in the room with all of the UN member states, the governments of the world, and who talks about what, right? What does the US push? Technology, right? Um, what does Latin America push? Indigenous. Indigenous knowledge, right? It's really Norway, fish. <laughs> Argentina, beef, right? It's like it's always, you know, it's, it's almost predictable. But there is a big movement around um, the concern for um, the rights of indigenous peoples to land, to, to food, to their um, traditional ways. And, but more importantly, that they are um, really important sources for what food systems should look like moving forward. Um, so they get attention in the UN. I think when you leave, maybe some people would disagree with me, when you leave the UN, it, there's less attention on that. Until you see it in the media and the news, like I thought, you know, I, th I think a lot of you saw the Brazilian forest fires. There was a lot on indigenous peoples and, and what that means for their communities and that, that very much rely on the Amazon. But um, y you don't really see a lot when we talk about poli food policy, um, the person, whether it be you know, the young African-American woman sitting in Baltimore living in a food desert to you know, an indigenous person sitting in um, you know, the northern territories of Canada, you don't s they're not really in the dialogue. And we need to figure out how to engage in that dialogue, and I think Greta and the whole youth movement and climate has taught the older generations that screwed everything up that um, they need to be part of the conversation. And so I think there's a big shift right now of who should be sitting at the table, who should be sitting at the UN Food Summit. Should it be me? No. It should be all the young people, that all the students. There should be a big student coalition that goes to New York and fights for, for food and climate. So I think there's a real push right now, but it needs to filter outside of the UN and the civil society movements um, and really get into policy making where it matters. Yeah, it's a great question though. Let's take it. Yeah. I'm Bill Brandon. I'm an architect working on technologies in controlled environment agriculture. Now, uh, I want to raise a question uh, about uh, uh, how you uh, view a contextual question. And I think two important words are aggregators and disseminators. If you ask the question about where are the new future farmers going to come from, mm. that's not going to be a problem if they can make a living off of farming. Yeah. And that has broken down through the consolidation of the aggregators or big business who are then disseminating. When you had an economy where the uh, producers were the aggregators and disseminators all in one, that worked very well. It was more localized. It, they kept more of the f uh, value chain and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So... Part of the question, I think, comes to looking at how you value every component of that circular economy nature. Mm -hmm. And one of the big questions is, how do you view food waste? Um, whoa. Uh, uh, and I think there's a difference between wasted food and food waste. There's always going to be mm -hmm. food waste. 
Um, but what do you do with it? And right now the big push is to turn it into energy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are people who are looking at the question of fish as a good protein source, and what do you feed the fish? Well, Cargill's present idea that they're investing in around Memphis is that they're using methanotropes to eat natural gas and make that a fish food. So that's energy to food. It seems kind of backwards to me, but Cargill can, seems to feel like they can make money off of it, <laughs> so they're doing it. But uh, uh, food waste is a substrate for insects and worms and all things that are very fast producers of protein, which the fish need. And so there's a question of when you, you, you don't have an integrated system and you have kind of a globalized system, how do, you, how do you aggregate that? Everybody kind of is saying, you know, we got to do something about cutting the food waste. My question is, how do you use it mm. and how do you aggregate yeah. it? And that is a, a real big problem. No, I, I think it's a great question I don't have an answer to. I mean, I think it's, but I think there's a lot of innovation happening around wasted food and what you do with that. Like you said, I mean, there's a, a, a woman I know, she's an entrepreneur in Kenya, and she's taking wasted food, um, boiling it down into a fortified stew and putting it in Tetra packs and then selling that. And it's a great, it's a great business. And uh, She's got a lot of investors behind her, but she's basically taking all of Nairobi's food scraps and making this fortified, delicious sort of broth um, that can be cooked with or added to soups. Um, it's a great idea, right? It's a, and, and she's doing it in a big, kind of disorganized city. Um, and it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, her name's CJ Jones, if anyone wants to, more information about her. But she's... But there, we need a lot more of these kind of examples where there's real innovation happening in, in the food system. So it's a great, great uh, question that I don't have all the answers to, but yeah. Let's take one more question. Hey, so you briefly mentioned uh, aquaculture. And I guess my question is, what are the threats and opportunities in aquaculture as they relate to sustainability, and more generally, what is the future of fish? You already know this, Jake. <laughs> He's just testing me. Um, so not being an aquaculture expert. I mean, I think one of the big things is that, you know, salmon, for example, you need, um, you know, they need omega-3s to stay alive. And they are an omega-3 fatty fish that we love, and it's good for us as well. But to get those omega-3s, they need the small fish, um, the sardines, the anchovies, the bottom of the, the seafood chain that so many of the bigger fish in the ocean rely on. But you're, if you take those small fish out, you completely collapse the marine ecosystem and the hierarchy of that. And so I think by feeding these salmon, these small fish, it's a huge risk for marine resources. Um, and so there's a lot of technologies now on how do you get omega-3s to salmon without completely wiping out the bottom of the, of the food chain of the ocean. Um, so there's a lot of algae-type technologies happening, different kinds of food pellets, again, using food waste, um, insects, et cetera. But I think um, it's one issue of many in the aquaculture of just kind of this very unsustainable practices and then using certain fertilizers and pesticide runoffs in the aquaculture um, that, that, that poses issues. There's, there's a lot of um, innovation, though, happening in, happening in the aquaculture space. And fish you know, is, one, is the biggest global traded commodity, I think, in the world of all the, all the food. Um, and there was a great nature paper by a colleague at Johns Hopkins in the School of Public Health looking at the importance of fish for diets. It's, it really is, it's up there with eggs as being, you know, almost a perfect food. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of cultural issues too around fish. A lot of cultures don't like it. They don't like the smell of it. They don't like to handle it. Um, so there's a lot of consumer issues with fish as well. 
But um, so if you think of that as a sustainability issue, there's kind of the consumer side as, of, of acceptability. But um, yeah, so that's just one example of, of this kind of unsustainable practice at the moment with the demand for salmon and fatty fish. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Well, this has been a very enlightening and uh, wide-ranging discussion. Uh, so why don't we thank uh, Professor Fanzo for a fantastic talk. <laughs>